ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕੀ ਫਤਿਹ ਸੰਗਤ ਟੈਲੀਵਿਜ਼ਨ ਤੇ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਨਿੱਘਾ ਸਵਾਗਤ ਹੈ ਮੈਂ ਕਮਲਪ੍ਰੀਤ ਕੌਰ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਲਈ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਹਾਜ਼ਰ ਹਾਂ ਕੈਂਡਿਡ ਕਨਵਰਸੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਇਸ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਸੀਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਰੂਬਰੂ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਇੰਟਰਸਟਿੰਗ ਪਰਸਨੈਲਿਟੀਆਂ ਨੂੰ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਐਂਡ ਦੀ ਆਈਡੀਆ ਆਫ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਇਸ ਟੂ ਬ੍ਰਿੰਗ ਅਕਰੋਸ ਟੂ ਯੂ ਅ ਵਾਈਡ ਸੈਟ ਆਫ ਪੀਪਲ ਹੂ ਹੈਵ ਕੰਟ੍ਰਿਬਿਊਟਡ ਸੋ ਮਚ ਟੂ ਆਰ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਇਨ ਟੁਡੇਸ ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰਾਮ ਵੀ ਹੈਵ ਵੈਰੀ ਵੈਰੀ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ ਗੈਸਟਸ ਸਪੈਸ਼ਲ lovely colorful beautiful who have actually contributed so much to our community in terms of stature through art that one look at them one look at their work and you would know who i'm talking about yes of course the saint twins a very warm welcome thank Such you such a call such a call thank you it's lovely to have both of you in our studio at uh, london and i hope you're doing all right we're yes, fine thank fine. you it's lovely to be here <laughs> and i have uh, to my side immediately on my uh, left though they don't want to be you know personally identified <laughs> but i would love to let you know that it's amrita and that's rabindra and they are the same twins who have uh, created a niche for themselves in the art world and we are going to talk about their journey the journey of their life the journey of their art today in this program Welcome to Candid Conversations. Let's start with your life as children. How was it when you were little? Fond memories of being little, really. I mean, we were born in London, mm -hmm. um, brought up mostly in the Liverpool area, though. We moved there when we were just toddlers. But we always remember the large extended family that we grew up in and the okay. fun times that we had with that. A great sense of security and happiness as, as children, I think. Um, mm. Tremendous memories, isn't Definitely. it? Definitely. picnics in the park and uh, our family versus the rest of the park with cricket matches and <laughs> all, all kinds of things trips to the beach yeah. i think we were very lucky actually surrounded by a very loving family uh, i said it, quite a large extended family our, our father's the eldest of nine brothers and two sisters so you can imagine all the sort of offshoots yeah. of that lots of cousins brothers and sisters that we grew up with hmm. and are still today living in an extended family so that's uh, a memory that we carry with us now even and how, do you feel exactly the same Oh, of course, we always feel exactly the same. <laughs> Whatever she says, it's ditto from your side. Okay. So, you know, you know, normally it's said that because you're twins, one, you're identical. Does it actually also go with the psychological aspect of it? So you look at the things in the same way, you mm. perceive the things in the same way. I think does it happen with you? I think in our case it does. Uh, I mean, we've had identical upbringing since the age of Dot. We've, okay. we've only ever... been away from each other for one week when I was in hospital when wow. I was about 20 something ish so So who is the elder one um, of you two? I'm the eldest. I'm You're just the by 10 minutes so it's really not that much. Okay. So with yeah. that identical experience I think our sort of social political outlook cultural outlook is identical too and I think one particular experience as as uh, children that had a huge impact on both of us it helped to shape the people that we are and the way mm. that we think about the world around us and our own you know cultural identity yeah. is our very first trip to india mm -hmm. back in 1980 and okay. that was just a a wonderful experience where um well it wasn't an ordinary trip no it? It was <laughs> it wasn't. our father being our father he made it into a real adventure so we okay. built a motor home i say we our father and his brothers built a purpose made motor home and we drove from England to India. Oh, you literally we drove yes, in yeah. that vehicle. So yes, it was we... a real uh, adventure in that sense and then once we reached India we traveled around India for 9 months. So in in the same vehicle. In the same vehicle. Oh, wow. But it was kitted out with, you know, all the amenities, a kitchen and beds and bathroom mm -hmm. and everything. So we were very self-sufficient. Yeah. But that's intriguing. Where's that vehicle now? Oh, oh, I don't know. Probably in some trending scrap. around. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's <laughs> But but, but that that's quite an ingenious thing to do, you know, actually to come up with something like that and on that scale and yeah. how many people were there in that vehicle? Well, the whole family there were, well, there were six of us at that time. And um I say our father was has always been very forward thinking and I think his idea of an education which it truly was a yeah. real education just seeing the world you know at the first time age mm. and then once we got to india that was a real life changing experience for us it really um instilled a great sense of pride in our cultural heritage mm. uh, and when we say cultural heritage we feel that the whole of india yeah you know, its diversity really its diversity mm. of the cultures in india not just our punjabi specific yeah, yeah. cultural heritage and we traveled around india and we visited museums and galleries and the palaces bloody. and mm. caves and you know it was a real exposure to all that india had to offer on a cultural level and mm. it was at that time really that we um our journey as artists 
started because at that time we came into contact with Indian miniature painting tradition for mm. the first time. Mm. And we're just completely bowled over mm. by the exquisiteness of those uh, paintings. You know, the, the sheer um, craftsmanship, the detail, the jewel-like quality with all the decorative aspects that come with that tradition. So before that, were you not drawing or painting? You know, generally we see toddlers, you know, putting mm -hmm. their hands in, your hand printing and stuff. Were you fascinated by colours then? I yeah, think, like, yeah. yeah. The of dot. Our earliest memories are scribbling in on walls <laughs> and, and then graduating to books and then our father in his wisdom buying us art materials and you know the favourite stocking fillers at Christmas time, felt tips and you know art pad and okay. so we've always uh, drawn, mm. painted, scribbled in our spare time. Growing so any together. recollections of one piece of art when you were little and you could actually you know, see, or have you have you actually kept some of them now yeah, for you to you. see? Well, Amrit has a piece that goes back to when she was four or five, mm, okay. and it was the first piece we ever. I say we, but <laughs> <laughs> that we as early the Sing Twins exhibited, and uh, it was part of a competition, mm, and it right. was exhibited in a, in a very posh shop in Chester, okay. like near where we live. Which is so still, still on our wall now. It's still oh, proudly beautiful. displayed on our, our wall in our living room. So mm. we have many pieces actually that we've collected. Throughout Over the years, time. from that age onwards, mm. yeah. Mm. And besides that, you know, as a family or that adventure which took you to India, are there any other aspects of uh, childhood which now reflect in you as mm. you work or as you create something? Well, I think um, people that know our work will realise, although it's rooted in the Indian miniature and there's a lot of our Punjabi Sikh heritage in there as well, mm. it is also very eclectic, has a very global outlook. And a lot mm. of the symbols that we use, a lot of the iconography that we use comes from different global and religious traditions. Yeah. I mean, the other part of our upbringing in education, if you like, is that we, went, we both went to a Catholic convent school. Yeah, yeah. And I think the choice in that was that, you know, the first class education and the, the religious discipline. And yeah. In our day, you didn't have the choice to go to specific, you know, Sikh schools or Hindu schools, Muslim schools. Yeah. It was a very limited choice. And I think mm. the Catholic education was known to be the best the most of the time. disciplining, yes. and, you know, yeah, educating. Some spiritual, yeah, moral, moral, moral foundations that we had. So yeah. I think with that particular school, there was a beautiful chapel mm. attached. Mm. And um, within that, because it was a Catholic tradition, yeah. there were lots of um, artworks in there. In the statues and the stained glass and mm. the altarpieces and I think that really did inspire a very early interest in the richness of visual symbolism, visual art which mm. has carried through our work um, and also specific uh, elements of iconography and symbolism that we take as I say from Christianity, Buddhism, Sikhism yeah. generally. And bring it everything yes, that's kind yeah, of together. Mm. What happened after school? So you, you know that was when you were little then you went to school. How was the school like? Were you always popular as twins, you know, doing everything together? <laughs> I think we were looked on with suspicion as twins. That's the fate of most twins, I think, really? unfortunately. Yes, yeah, I think people feel that there's something a little bit weird about twins, rightly or wrongly. But I think it's quite and fascinating, it's, <laughs> isn't it? Well, there is that side, but there was also in that day that when we were at school, there was this sort of uh, uh, professional opinion that twins should be made to actively be made to be different and there was okay. this suspicion that you know to be alike was somehow unfair on the other students you had this um, kind of uh, intellectual bond that gave you an mm. advantage over other students for example and okay. the fact that you they felt that you weren't developing as you know the individuals they mm. felt was a damaging thing so at school um, we were always uh, initially we were allowed to sit in the same class and then quite quickly we were put on separate desks well away from each other I mean, oh. we would always want to sit together yeah uh, and then that trans translated later on into not just separate desks, but separate classrooms, so the oh, okay. sort of tiering level that we had in, in the school system. Mm. So we found that quite um, oppressive in a way, because we naturally have always been very close, mm. as we have been with our other siblings. But um, we couldn't really understand that attitude of why people felt it was such a threatening or an unhealthy situation mm. for twins mm. to grow up and, and enjoy each other's company. And having the same interests, no. because of course, no. once you're out of the classroom, we were always you were still again together, back to yes. doing yeah. things together yeah. and being interested in the same things. So mm. when it came to doing our first degree, which was a combined studies degree at uh, you know, university level, we both were interested in comparative religion at that time. And yeah. um, mm. you know, that was our, our idea was to become academics in that field. 
And the combined studies course that we did, you know, we went to the same university mm. and um, we chose the same three subjects that made up the combined studies degree, the first choice being the comparative religion, okay. then early church history, which was completely fascinating. Mm. And as luck would have it, um, the only other su subject that would fit into the timetable with those two was a course on uh, 20th century Western art history. Okay. Mm. And at that time, we had no intention of being artists. Art was still very much a hobby for us. Okay. Um, and we had, you know, in our own time, been cultivating the Indian miniature style, mm. trying to learn the techniques for ourselves. Since that trip to books. India, really? Yeah, since mm. the trip to India. <laughs> so uh, you, you were working on your own, mm. in the back, backdrop of whatever you, you're doing otherwise, or yeah. you intended yeah, to do? Yeah, always mm. been there, but it was always seen as, you know, by ourselves as a hobby. Okay. And, uh, you know, the academia world was something that was, was beckoning to us at that mm. time. Mm -hmm. And it was only really um, because of the attitude that we faced within our, the art department during that first degree that um, really pushed us into the arts because the attitude that we faced there to the type of work that we wanted to develop, I mean, mm. we were very much inspired by the Indian miniature style and mm. wanted to continue that. I mean, when we'd gone to India, we were very disappointed to see that that uh, tradition was almost, well, more or less neglected within mm. the contemporary art world. You go to any... Um, modern art gallery at that time and it seemed they were just churning out clones of what the West yeah, had to yeah. offer and we were thinking you know where is our Indian heritage in okay. contemporary expression why are we following the West all the time so even at that earlier age our mission was to revive this tradition yeah. um, even if we were doing it on our own <laughs> kind of behind closed doors and yeah, this is to... you know why I find this fascinating is because born and brought up here educated in a Catholic school mm. and still you felt so strongly about your own heritage mm. and and then you know as you said something happened which actually pushed you to make sure that you bring your hobby into the uh, main mm. uh, you know stage yeah. of your life. Mm. Well I think your so, identity is not linked to where you're born mm. I think it's something internally. From within yeah. yeah. When yeah. we went to India something instantly connected with to us, you know inwardly with us you know okay. call it a soul connection with with the land of our father forefathers if you mm. like. Mm. So we were really um, in tune with that side of our heritage and to be quite honest before we went to India I mean we, we've always grown up in a very western um, community yeah. I mean we're not you know in Birmingham and other places you're surrounded by your own community but where we live in Liverpool area yeah. there were a handful of families yeah. and so of course we were aware that we were from a Sikh Punjabi background but it wasn't until we went to India that we really experienced that in depth and the wider, you know, Indian culture. Mm. Actively mm. And, we'd, more. and we'd always had the peer pressure on us to conform to Western ways of living and yeah. dressing and socialising mm. because our school, you know, our yeah. classmates were all what came from that Absolutely. Western background. And, you know, you are made to feel, I think, at, from a very early age growing up in this country that you're, somehow your traditional culture is inferior, whether it mm. be through peer pressure or whether it be through the media, which very often perpetrate negative stereotypes of what our, you know, the tra traditions mm. of our community are about. And when we went to India, we were so full of pride of that that we came back thinking nobody's going to tell us that our, you know, our traditional heritage, our Indian heritage, is inferior to mm. you know, West Western culture. Mm. So when we got to university and we found our art tutors criticising um, the Indian miniature style as literally they were saying it was outdated, it's backward, it's got no place within contemporary art. So mm. they kind of dissuaded you not to take it or they you know? They tried to. It. They tried yeah. to oh, okay. present us with Western role models of contemporary art, mm -hmm. you know, the big names like Picasso and Mane, yeah. Mane and Gauguin. Mm. And um, we just felt that was an extension of the prejudice that we had grown up with all our okay. lives living here, that constant pressure to conform, to be accepted. Mm. Well, yeah. the kind of West is best syndrome, mm. really, wasn't it? You know, that colonial yeah. attitude that mm. the Western world leads the way and everybody else has to aspire mm. to follow that. Mm. So it was then we decided, OK, no, you know, you're not going to tell us that Western art is better than Indian art and that traditional art forms are of no value anymore. Mm. I mean, their idea was that you have to develop and you have to become you know, abstract or conceptual or whatever art form happened mm, to be the, the, trend, the, of the trend, trend at the time. Yeah. And our idea was, well, why do we have to keep de developing? If something's not broken, why are we trying to fix it? To mm. us, that this tradition was perfect. Uh, it was, you know, the narrative and, um, you know, it was a perfect way of, of communicating, telling a story. And so we really did a U-turn. We um, but against the hypocrisy, against really, the wasn't hypocrisy there? that was we a... faced, we yeah. thought, no, we're going to take this form. And our mission from then on became to try and challenge the establishment. So did you actually graduate <laughs> in what you were doing and in what you wanted? So how did it? How did they take you? Know, it's it's like 
<laughs> it's a rebellion, <laughs> out and out rebellion. And they, they, didn't, they didn't take it really, because I think one of the annoying things was that we were being told we couldn't study this Indian hmm. art form, that it had no place in contemporary art. Okay. And yet the, the artists that they were putting forward to us, who were from the Western world, had themselves been innovators because they had been inspired by non-European art forms hmm. from Africa, from Japan, from India. Yeah. And we thought, well, you know, they, the Western art has progressed the way it has because of that non-European influence. And we're yeah. simply doing the same. So, you know, what's so wrong about it now? And I think it, it did become a, a principle, a point of principle that we, you know, stick to our guns. And unfortunately, it was our downfall in, in sort of um, material terms, if I could put it that way, hmm. because our final degree was um, downgraded okay. in the third year when one of the examiners refused to mark our final dissertation, which okay. both of us had argued the point in different ways hmm. of how important non-European art had been to Western art. Okay. And they obviously didn't like that and we, well, it's a very long story, but the, the upshot of it was that we went through several years battling with the university to get hmm. our degree reinstated. And eventually it went through an appeal system after years of wrangling over, you know, who should sit on yeah, the panel and so yeah. on and so forth. The panel came down in our favour and told the university that they had to mark this work and reinstate our okay. first class degrees is what we were given okay. by the internal examiners. Brilliant. So it was reinstated, but only to a 2-1. Mm. And we weren't happy so with we that. Refused we refused the degree twice, actually. Uh, mm. Once when we were initially supposed to have graduated. Then we had the appeal, they sent us this new grade. Okay. We refused that and wanted to see all the mark sheets and how they'd come to that conclusion. Okay. And it turned out that there'd been a little bit of, uh, as far as we could see, jiggery pokery and underhandedness, to put it politely. So we sent the degree back and to this day we don't have the degree because it was kind of left hanging there. And mm. I think as the years went by, the degree in itself became less important. Yeah. I mean, by that time, over several years, we'd obviously moved on. We'd gone on to uh, read for, um, our research, PhD research, at a different university who, yeah. fortunately for us, our sister had studied there. And on the basis of her reputation and her academic ability, yeah. they accepted us um, despite on, on not yeah, despite first not having our first degree. But we did have to sit the, the final year, third year course, to prove to other people in the, in the departments, if you like, that we were um, capable yeah. of being, you know, and. and uh, could be accepted as, as valid students there. Hmm. So it was a long haul and uh, it was a really uh, traumatic actually and upsetting time. But I think in hindsight, it's, it's been a tremendously important part of our lives. Yeah, but and it's, if, if you look at it, you, you know, going back, hmm. that's how you shaped up and that's definitely. how the whole concept, the Sing Twins, doing, you know, doing what you want to do really and hmm. doing it in a big way that everyone stands and notices. I think so. It, it gave us a cause, I think. The resilience as well. Yeah. I mean, art became, from that point onwards, it wasn't just a hobby. It, it now became, mm -hmm. yeah, a political tool to really mm -hmm. champion what we had experienced first as the sort of cultural prejudice. Um, and it, it, it wasn't just... the themes of our work, yeah. too. So that early prejudice, I mean, the, the, the works we started doing from that time onwards mm -hmm. were all about promoting our identity as Punjabis yeah. living in the West. So yeah. a lot of our earlier works like Naramla's Wedding and Wedding Janj and uh, you know, uh, All Hands on Deck, they concentrate on celebrating hmm. traditions like the extended family, the, you know, the arranged marriage That's ceremony, you know, typical customs like the Wedding Janj, yeah. against the backdrop of a Western um, you know, city. Hmm. So you know, it's our way of saying, you know, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater and also we demand acceptance on our own terms. Yes, yeah. we're proud of our heritage. We're born in Britain, we're proud of being British too, but yeah. our, our you know, Indian heritage is important and you know, we're celebrating this and you must accept it on, as on our own terms. But it was also to try and encourage um, our peers, if you like, and younger generations mm -hmm to be proud of their heritage too. I Absolutely. think we were very lucky in having that experience in India, but yeah. a lot of our, our you know, younger generations had never been to India and they were still facing the same peer pressure mm. and media pressure to, to make them feel somehow insecure. And to make a choice actually. Yeah. I mean, the question that we were often asked at, at school, you know, by teachers or school friends was, mm. well, what are you? Are you? Are you English or are you Indian? Or are you British or are you Indian? Mm. Okay. Which was just seemed a bizarre question to us because we, we had questioned never questioned it. it growing up. Like I guess many, many of our yeah, want, yeah. Asians or Chinese or whoever growing up in Britain, they are who they are and they have experience and the benefits I think of both mm -hmm. cultures often, more often than not. So and with all this going around <coughs> and uh, you know, a lot of pressure as you said, resilience and you decided to you know, take it forward, also you know, become 
uh, create a uh, you know idealistic situation for other people to follow when you did this the contribution that you actually brought to the british art world scene is immense as well mm -hmm. you know the work that you do it's seen as past modern so how mm -hmm. how how do you define that you know your work mm -hmm. in that sense well the term Past modern really came from, again, our university experience, because mm. what they were rejecting was, first of all, a, a tradition that was non-European on yeah. Indian heritage, and also a tradition Guided that was, tradition. Uh, you know, had ancient roots. It wasn't a modern art form. Yeah. So um, I think the past modern description that we use of our own work was really a way of trying to promote that idea that modern art today doesn't have to be all about here and now. It, it really should be. And, and I think in many ways has always developed as a combination of what's gone on before and what is developing now. Mm. So it's combining that idea of East and West tradition and modernity and finding a, an acceptance of that and, and accepting that as a valid art form, not just within art, but also within our daily lives, the way that many of us live our lives mm. in two traditions, mm. in two eras, if you like, both the traditional and our modern life. And we can balance that quite happily without having any major yeah. hangovers about who we are and where mm. we sit culturally. Or, well, you don't you know. have to, to mm. reject your traditional your traditions in order to become westernised or, or modern. And, and I think, I think all of your art pieces kind of <laughs> speak for you in that way, because everything is a beautiful confluence of the Western and mm. Indian traditions, the way everything fuses. You don't you don't see the dichotomy or you don't see the dilemma, yeah. which, which you know, you practically feel when you grow up. But then it, it's so much part of you that you actually don't see it as anything yeah. different. Well, I think it's about taking the best of both worlds or three or four or five worlds. I mean, you are inspired by what you're inspired hmm. by enjoying your experiences of growing life up. life experience. But I think, you know, there was very much this concept here growing up that somehow second generation Asians had to have this conflict between being British and Asian. Hmm. It's not something that we ever felt ourselves. And I, and I often think that it's an, an ideal that is, is kind of put into people's minds that, you know, to, to make them feel hmm. somehow their traditional culture is inferior. Hmm. And, you know, this whole idea of, of wanting people hmm. to assimilate into the wider community, which is something not that we, we don't advocate ourselves. I think people should be allowed to it's about choice, celebrate really? their own yeah. heritage and identity and feel free to do that without hmm. feeling somehow that they're not part of the wider community. How is it technically difficult or easy to bring that confluence, to actually create a perfect fusion of the two when you work? Do you work together, like on an art piece? Do you, do you work together, mm. you know, on one piece or sometimes yeah. you... How, how do you work? Well, it's a combination of ways of working, really. Mm -hmm. um, there are times where we have a, a single artwork that okay. we both work on and Sometimes we will work in a, a rotor, so we will literally clock on and off and take over from each other, where one finishes and the other sort of takes on from there. And uh, particularly with commissioned works, um, we both want to have an input in that, so we will definitely have a joint input from mm. right from the beginning of the research for the painting, mm. because there's a lot of um, history and politics and, and social commentary that goes into many of our works, mm. and obviously you have to research all the arguments on both mm. sides. We like our works very much to be a dialogue and it's not necessarily things that we um, are, ex kind of our own opinions that we're explaining, but a, a dialogue that happens in yeah. society, whether it's about politics or pop culture or, you know, multiculturalism. Um, you so just mentioned, you know, the works that you're commissioned. So when you've been actually commissioned for a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of things, mm -hmm. a lot of... Uh, things that were happening and mm. you, you were commissioned. To, would you like to sp uh, talk us through the different works that you took up and how they inspired you mm -hmm. and how, how did you contribute to the whole idea of uh, that work? Well, uh, the works th that are commissioned are done in several ways. I mean, mostly our public commissions are through galleries and museums. Um, or city councils. Both in, yeah, both in the UK mm. and abroad. So would you like to councils. mention some of them? Well, one, for example, uh, with the Commonwealth Games in 2002 in Manchester. Yeah. Obviously, we're from the North West, and I think they were looking for an artist to be what they call an artist in residence. So it's an artist that goes and looks at what the Commonwealth Games are all about and then they yeah. produce a work in response to that. And so my sister and I were selected um, to be artists in residence for that year. So we chose to create a painting that we felt reflected the identity of uh, Manchester City and we focused very much on the city coat of arms but reinterpreted that in the light of what the Games represented and yeah. uh, how it represented the changing identity of the city as this sort of very multicultural and um, 
uh, arts rich um, city. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, other similar commissions that we've done, for example, in 2008, much more recently, yeah. uh, evolve around our home city of Liverpool, which yep. was nominated for European Capital of Culture status that particular year. And again, the city put out a tender to many artists to submit ideas on how they would represent and document the city, mm. that very important sort of historical event in the city's life. Um, my sister and I were commissioned to create two paintings actually because that particular year also coincided with the 800th anniversary of the city in 2007. Mm. So the city asked us to do one work which represented its, its birthday, if you like, its 800 okay. years, and another work which represented how you it intended to okay. yeah, celebrate mm. the 08 Capital of Culture yeah. Year. Mm. We were both very broad, broad yeah. themed and meant to be specifically about Liverpool. Hmm. But with, as with many of our commissions, we always try and reflect our own community within a broader context and yeah. broader, um, platform. Hmm. So with both of those works, for example, the, the one that related the history of the city, um, the, that same year also happened to be you know, the anniversary of our own religion. Sikhism. Hmm. Of, of Sikhism. So within the cityscape of Liverpool itself, we're representing our own celebration, if you like, as a community with the little banner of Guru Nanak Dev Ji, you know, sitting amongst the Liverpool uh, cityscape. Mm. And likewise with the work that represented the Capital That's of Culture Year and the celebrations that took place. Um, there's one particular work called Arts Matters, which is based on a, a theatrical theme, if you like, where the city is represented as a theatre, showcasing all it has to offer culturally. And in one of the little theatre boxes is a, an image of Dilip Singh, mm. which represented uh, an exhibition that we curated that same year called Six in Print. I mean, one of our other interests, if you like, is mm. collecting um, printed material to do with the six, historical material. And that year, so much was happening yeah. as the capital of culture. We wanted to put the six on the map too. So we curated that exhibition and then we represented that exhibition within the main painting. So and I think through your artwork, it's so much, you know, it, the presence of the community in the whole system, in the whole scenario fits in beautifully. Mm -hmm. The lovely conversation with the beautiful Singh Twins will continue after a short break. We'll take a break, come back to Candid Conversations with Kamal Preet Kaur, just in a short while. Candid Conversations with Kamal Preet Kaur. Break to bad, ek aur fair thoda bahut hi nega swagat hai. A very warm welcome once again. And we are joined by beautiful Singh twins, the colourful personalities, exuberant personalities, the resilient personalities who have brought so much to our community through the work of art. Welcome back again. Thank you. And uh, just before uh, going to the break, we were talking about the works you've been commissioned for. When you look at the whole thing, you know, the things that go around you, you know, socially, politically, or something happens, which affects you so much, how do you get to reflect in your work of art? So or do you want to talk about some of the artwork of yours, which mm -hmm. actually makes those statements that how you were affected by it? Okay, well, I think we could probably go way back to our very earliest works, mm -hmm. the ones that were inspired by the prejudice that we experienced at uh, university on the art course. Okay. Because many of those are very orientated around family and community and arranged marriage and all, and all those institutions that were very much blackened in, in the mainstream media as being oppressive. Yeah. So those images in themselves, although they appear on the surface to be very happy images of you know what we celebrate as Asians, mm -hmm. they are actually making a political statement about the value of that within our society, but also within our own Sikh heritage. I yeah. think for us, 
and in, in Sikh philosophy and theology, if you like, the, the institution of family and community is very, very important. Absolutely. I mean, you know, family is a, is a, is a means to, you know, spiritual um, betterment, if you yeah. like. Yes, yeah. it's a training ground and how to be less selfish, to give and take. So not just works like Nirmala's Wedding and, and Wedding Jhanj, which show the wedding ceremony itself, but mm. also works like All Hands on Deck, which shows the togetherness of the family and the fact that every member of the family has a role, whether it's duty or responsibility yeah. or your time to be taken care of by the elders, ho Absolutely. however that interreaction is, mm. I think was a very important uh, aspect of our Sikh philosophy that we wanted to share with our audiences mm. and particularly as twins who uh, in many ways were kind of victimised for being twins and, and mm. not being seen as individuals, which really got us thinking about this whole ideology of individually, uh, individuality, which for us is a very Western concept, you know, yeah. indiv individuality versus, you know, as I say, community. family and community that we wanted to put across the other side that, you know, and really when we look at society, is there any such, a th you know, is there such a thing as individuality anyway in its yeah. truest form? Because when we looked around us, uh, you know, everybody is inspired by, uh, you know, the media telling them what to eat or drink yeah. or which pop group to follow and everybody wants to follow the same fashion trend, for example, yeah. and be part of a, a peer group. So I think we were trying to kind of politically turn that idea on its head and get people to really examine even the ideals within Western society. Do mm. they really exist? Are they really of the value that people purport them Besides to be? Besides that, there, there are very then, strong visuals of the political people. Like in the Grim Reaper, there is mm. the, 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 you know, the image of Margaret yeah. Thatcher and the concept of war and everything. Mm. Yeah. What all is going through your mind when you do that? Well, I think as our experience widened, you know, uh, beyond, our own our community. beyond our own community and our own experience. Obviously, you're looking at the news and you're looking at the world around you. And um, I mean, there's pieces like yes, the, the Grim Reaper, which was, was spurred on just by a, a statement that I read in the, the newspaper mm. where Margaret Thatcher turned around to Michael Portillo in, in, uh, and said to him, Michael, have you ever, ever won a war? I have. And that really angered me because I was thinking how... Uh, conceited and egotistical arrogant, yeah. and arrogant for that politicians mm. to feel they've won a war when actually the reality is that they are the kind of the warmongers that send other people to do their dirty work for them mm. and cause so many deaths on both sides for Absolutely. the sake of their pursuit of, of power. Mm. Mm. Similarly with the Bush and, and Blair similarly, painting. Yeah, with the mm. Bush and Blair painting that we've done, Partners in Crime, which is our response to the Iraq war and yeah. the kind of um, the seat of the reasons to why we went into that war. The lies in the seat. Yeah, mm. so which is mm. kind of re reflected in the border of the painting, which mm. from a distance looks like an Islamic pattern, a beautiful pattern. It's only when you look closely at the border that you can see the, the truth, if you like, behind the facade, that it's made up of images of a, a father holding his dead child, you know, mm. an Iraqi father. Mm. And then, you know, there are other events in history. I mean, we were at school when 1984 happened, the storming of the Golden Temple. And again, that was something that um, struck deep, you know, within us, uh, as it did with, you know, all of our community. Mm. And at that time, um, we didn't, um, I mean, we, we did a very small painting called um, The Storming of the Golden As an immediate Temple, response as an to immediate that, immediate yeah. response to that. And it wasn't until quite a few years later, mm. in 1999, where we were building up to our first UK tour, and we're thinking about bigger pieces to put in this tour, that we felt um, we wanted to do justice to that theme. We felt the small work hadn't really done justice and by that time, you know, the period of time that had lapsed between 84 and 99, we'd obviously read and become a lot more informed about what, the events. What had gone on, yeah. Yeah, so 1984 really, I think, was our, our biggest political piece to but date that and something that was a reflection of not so much the politics of 84 in media itself. Media censorship, really. I think mm. it was our reaction to the media censorship. I mean, we went to school at the time and our friends would say, oh, you know, all, all six are terrorists and mm. that was something that we had to deal with on a you know a kind of daily basis because yeah. of the, the media bias and the, the fact that almost nobody was aware of the innocent suffering and death that was caused by that event you know the, the innocent pilgrims who were caught up in the crossfire yeah we wanted the 1984 piece so many years down the line to reflect those issues so mm. if you look in 1984 the painting, it's focusing, you know, we're not interested in the politics of Bindarawali and, you know, both sides and nitty gritty. We, we just wanted to reflect the, innocent the, the lives corruption lost. of politics mm. that causes the, the, you know, suffering and death of innocent people and how this is a universal issue. So we have, you know, Indra Gandhi, for example, riding, you know, on, on a tank in the Golden mm. Temple. It's not an actual historical account. And you she also give, in, there, in, in that particular picture, <laughs> it's more like a bird's eye view of the whole 
whole thing, you know? Mm. Yeah, well, again, that's a convention that we've, we've picked up from the traditional Indian miniature mm. painting uh, style. You know, very often you would see different viewpoints within the same composition. Yeah. Not in the way that you would, you know, the Western art is very much kind of, mm. uh, the importance is put more on realism and kind of three, three dimension. But showing that bird's eye view, there is a symbolic reference uh, why we've done that. It's mm. not, it doesn't just allow us to show um, the full the, the image, activity, if you like, yeah. the impact, you know, the blood streaming yeah. from the Golden Temple. But mm. it was also a um, really symbolic way of showing our geographic distance from what was happening. Here were we in the UK, mm. looking from a distance as what was happening in India, mm. being helpless really in a way to do anything about what was happening. And that's juxtaposed within the same painting. If you look lower down the painting, you see a very claustrophobic close-up view of the pilgrims it's trying like to street see level. Mm. from the complex. And mm. that was kind of the emotional uh, closeness, if you like, as, as opposed to the geographic distance that mm. we as six were relating to this event. Mm. And we've tried to put 1984 in a historical context too as to why we felt the six were so aggrieved as what had happened mm. in relation to you know, the sacrifices that they'd made for India. Um, you know, for example, you've got um, Baba Deep Singh represented yeah. within the crowds. Of, of the, again, you know, it's not a hi historically accurate painting. It's telling a wider story. It's going back in history and showing these are the kind of sacrifices, mm. you know, Baba Deep Singh, Bhagat later Singh. on Bhagat Singh, you know, they're all Jali represented Wala Bhag, in there. All of Jali those. Mm. incidents represented in there mm. Mm. to show the kind of sacrifices the Sikhs made for India, which was now, you know, become the public Think, enemy yeah. number one, if you like, that somehow, mm. wh why was India forgetting the sacrifices mm. the loyalty the had made and, and the, the pain that actually comes across to the through you know the pictures that you, that you see the bloodshed and all mm. i think it's it's enormous and whenever you look at the painting it's so overwhelming every time you see it you actually see the pain that that was caused and a lot of bloodshed and how actually people feel mm. while well, looking I, I at it. I hope that's the case. I mean, it, it happens to be one of the most uh, popular paintings wherever we mm. exhibit. We always make a point of giving it pride of place in, um, you know, the main Prominent focus position. in the exhibition. Yeah. And you'll be surprised or, or not maybe because it's such a universal theme, everybody can relate to suffering. Yeah. And no matter what communities see the work, whether they be, you know, from the Jewish community or, you know, the UK community or... Um, you know, Polish immigrants, they can all relate to that because mm. there's nowhere in the world that hasn't been touched by that kind of atrocity mm. through you know, the result of political corruption and greed. Yeah. And that was the message that we were really mm. trying to get through the 1984 painting. By You've also done history. a movie on that, isn't it? That, that's yes. also widely talked about? Yeah, that's called uh, 1984 and the Via Dolorosa Project. Mm. And I guess that combines our connection with Sikhism, Sikh history, but also with our knowledge of uh, Catholicism having been brought up in a, mm. a convent school and the purpose of that film really was to try and bring the event of 1984 to a community that we felt is much you know more widely understood globally that the mm. community of, of uh, Christianity yeah and we felt that by tying in that event with um, a tradition within the Catholic faith called the Via Dolorosa which talks about the suffering of Christ before he, he died in his mm. final hours, if you like, mm. we would hopefully try and uh, generate some kind of empathy from that huge, you know, Christian community mm. globally and non-Christian communities yeah, who understand Christianity those and affiliation mm. with what mm. we felt as six, what we suffered as six, mm. and uh, try and, you know, win a much broader audience uh, uh, sort of understanding about what we went through and hopefully generate more support for, you know, the ongoing battles of, you know, the widows that are still suffering, for yeah. example, and this horrible economic crisis that we're having mm. in Punjab, which I think is still linked to that whole, you know, sordid event, really. And how was the reaction to it? This was what <coughs> you wanted to do. Did you actually achieve what you wanted to do? How was the general response? Well, very it? much, I think we did. I mean, the film has been aired mostly through film festivals. Um, yeah. And there is a, a, a film festival, Sick Film Festival in, in America, which toured several cities at the time when that film was produced. But it wasn't just attended by six. There was one particular incident of a, a Christian lady in the audience mm. who was moved to tears, actually, and she came up to us afterwards and explained how she appreciated, you know, what the six had gone through simply because we had connected it with her own tradition. Yeah. And I think that was kind of... Um, I mean, that made us feel... We've done well, right, yeah, that we'd yeah. hopefully done something right. That our, I think maybe some six may look at the film and think, well, why are we linking... Christianity to Sikhism, yeah. what does it have to do, you know, are we trying to convert people to Christianity or what, whatever their thinking is, I think there may be some people who don't quite get the connection. But I think her response to that really vindicated mm. our position that mm. this is what the film was about. We have to bring that story to people outside of our own community because I think without the outside world's help, that issue, as I say, which is still ongoing, is really never going to be 
understood fully. It's never going to be resolved, you know, yeah. to the benefit of the community. So besides, besides this, I think uh, there are also lovely the portraits that you've done of mm -hmm. uh, Maharaja Dilip Singh and Maharaja yes. Ranjit Singh. Do you want to talk us a uh, through with that one? Well, Sikh history, we've always been fascinated mm. in. I think our first trip to India, as we mentioned earlier, going around India, part of that was visiting all the Gurdwara, all the historical um, sites and places yeah, I think associated when, especially with Especially when you're tradition. young, you're like sponges, you know. Yeah, definitely. You absorb everything I and know. you're moved by everything. Well, we, you know, we kind of are, being in those places was how we learned about that history. Mm. And I think Maharaja Ranjit Singh and Maharaja Dilip Singh have yeah. both been figures that we've, fascinated us since we first learnt about them for different reasons. Yeah. I mean Ranjit Singh, you know, the strong sort of secular Maharaja who really put Punjabs and Sikhs on a, on a global map. If you yeah. think about and the Sikhart. cosmopolitan <laughs> yeah, makeup of his court yeah. and Sikhart, a great yeah. patron of Sikhart. So he's our hero on many levels. Mm -hmm. But then his son Maharaja Dilip Singh, which tells a much, you know, a hugely different story and yeah. a very sad story, sad story. In, episode in our history. So they've fascinated us for many years and I think th these particular works actually were also um, inspired by uh, the interest that we discussed before in mm. collecting Sikh printed imagery, uh, much of which does relate to Ranjit Singh and Dilip Singh because mm. a lot of that imagery was produced by the um, Western media mm. of its time and mm. we're, we're talking more around the Victorian era. But of course, Punjab was of huge interest to the Western world at that time as it's a very strong, yeah. wealthy kingdom. So a lot of the news journals and periodicals of the time depict these two figures. And the particular artworks that we've done have been inspired by... It, it combines... Um, they're quite different to our other work in that they're not entirely painted by hand. Hmm. They're actually generated using computer technology, okay. scanning in many of the images that we've collected, the archive images that we've collected over the years, and then mm -hmm. combining that with... Um, artistic, uh, creative techniques, again, mm. generated in the computer. So they're what we call a, a multimedia or a digital uh, mixed media artwork. Mm. They only exist in the computer. They don't exist as until a, a painting until you print them <laughs> off, yes. Mm. So I think it was uh, two works that uh, were fulfilling both our academic in interest in mm. Sikh history and particularly these two figures because as with a lot of our portraits, there's a lot of symbolism in both works yeah. that say something about the personality and the achievements and the history mm. associated with these two figures. But they combine that also with our ongoing interest as artists to look to new mediums mm. and ways of developing the miniature tradition beyond the medium of painting. I mean, mm. we've done documentaries, we've done um, these digital artworks, but also we've diversified into animation as well. We've tried mm. to um, employ animation techniques to bring that medium of the Indian miniature to a broader audience. With, because of your huge contribution to actually, I would say, resurrect in a way the Indian miniature tradition that you have and also create a style of your own which is now so celebrated as the Singh Twin style. When you go back to address the countries, you know, you go and give speeches because you're invited, you, you, you are kind of an authority on the fusion of the two. What kind of response do you generate? What kind of people do you get to meet? Say, what kind of people you meet in India? Or vis-a-vis -vis what you kind of people you meet in the rest yeah. of the world? And how do they look at your work? Very varied, really, well, isn't yeah, it? Business we're asked and to art. present our work in very many contexts and to audiences as young as five hmm. to, you know, as old as 99. Hmm. And academic contexts, non-academic contexts. But um, <clears throat> I think overwhelmingly, wherever we've presented our work, we've, we've had a, a good appreciation of what we're... Um, doing not just in the themes that we explore, but you mm. know, in, in terms of trying to preserve a tradition which we feel is the value of preserving. And I think, particularly in India, uh, we had a, a touring exhibition there in 2003, a mm. very major exhibition. It was heartwarming to, to know from that, through the artist friends that we made uh, at the time, that because of our exhibition there, um, debates and dialogues did start to begin within the art colleges and art mm. circles about, OK, well, maybe this tradition is actually valuable and we mm. can actually make use of it within contemporary sort of revival expression. Within so yeah. I hope that we've kind of started a revival back in India too. The only irony, if you like, is that we, we're always going on about why can't India set its own standards and why does it always follow the West and wait for the Western stamp of approval? The mm. only irony that it's taken two artists that they perceive to be from the West <laughs> to come over and you know, Tell them, show value yeah. to an Indian tradition, which then they suddenly take notice of. Mm. So that's the downside. But overall, um, 
But that's the positive side of your contribution, isn't it? Yeah, yes. I, just, yeah <laughs> I just wish they'd come to realise it on their own without taking some, you know, taking us to mm. do it. But I think the pinnacle of that um, uh, kind of appreciation, if you like, has to be with the, our recent awarding of the MBE by yeah. Her Majesty. So how um, was how was that feeling? It, initially, it was mixed feelings <laughs> because but a lot it's of it's a historical yes, event, you it know, is an to historical win event, yeah, yes. as the first female to win mm. Indians. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, it was it was historical, and I think we came to realise the importance of accepting the award. Initially, we had a few dilemmas because of the whole association with Empire, because obviously mm. MBE means members of the British Empire, and again, people who know our work know that there's a lot of anti-imperial kind of statements in mm. there. Mm. And uh, but then I think it we felt that the kind of end justifies that in the sense that we have always worked all our lives to get recognition for this art form Absolutely. by the highest you know, levels of establishment mm. that you could possibly mm. aim for. Mm. And, and I think that had to vindicate... To enable us to do yeah. that too, I think. And I think as a way of encouraging other people who may be you know, experiencing similar struggles that we did, this mm. whole you know, cultural conflict, if you like, in terms of trying to find accept acceptance within the mainstream, mm. that it can, you know, it can be done. You just have to persevere and be true to who you are and um, you know, eventually, hopefully, people respect you for the messages that you have and not judge you from outward appearances. And to find that, I mean, because it wasn't just the MB, it was awarded for services to um, contribution to the development of Indian miniature within contemporary art. So hmm. coming from a position where our style was totally rejected by our art tutors as having no value in contemporary art hmm. to a position now where it's being recognised as part of the main, mainstream of contemporary art practice, I think... Hmm. Um, you know, we only had one. We had to. We had to accept it. Really. <laughs> so it was a. It was a brilliant moment. I think it really only struck home how important that was when we were actually at Buckingham Palace and seeing all the other recipients and and, and those are lovely. You know, the lovely images too. If you dressed exactly the same the way you do, mm. making a statement there and then the MBE and everything, and I, and I just uh, just assumed that how would your tutors have felt at the time? Mm. You know, look at look at the girls and what we were trying to do and look what what they were achieved has anyone ever come back to you from, no from i'm times? hoping they're keeping a low profile they're too ashamed to show their faces <laughs> yeah. after all the trouble they caused but uh, they've not been man enough to come up and say we were wrong yet so. mm. but without without that trouble we wouldn't be where we are yeah, today because that, that pushed us into this direction i mean obviously our, our ideas of becoming academics is still there because we do still put those hats on to do all the research you know when you do like research that. Is it easier to find material in the UK or because you're doing an Indian, Indian miniature tradition, you go back to India? Mm. How, you know, what are the difficulties you face in different countries yeah. or different... Well, in terms of the, the style itself, I mean, that's more or less been self-taught. So we've, we've had no formal training in the miniature traditional style. Mm. It was something that we had to learn through books, through visiting places like the Victorian Albert Museum, who have a wonderful collection of Indian miniatures there, taking photographs and trying to mm. you know, blow those up and see how the brush strokes were put down. Mm. So, so there have been different challenges. The style, mm. That's been um, you know, our, our, our research, if you like, just visually looking at, at the miniature and trying to fathom out the techniques. In terms of um, general research, I mean, it can come from anywhere from local level library books to internet research to, I mean, we may go on on location, so whether it's a research for a painting to do with the Sikhs in Glasgow, as in Mr Singh's India, one of the paintings mm. we've done, or our most recent um, commission for the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, which looks at the history of Sikhs in Canada. I mean, there was a certain um, element of research where obviously we, had, we visited Toronto and um, you know, interviewed members of the community about what was important to them to reflect their history within Canada, mm. as well as combining that with internet research and, and kind mm. of reading. But then there are paintings like varied. Entwined, which is a work mm. that looks at the Indian mutiny and the impact of that through history, mm. where again there's a very strong Sikh uh, presence in that because um, we felt that we, what we wanted to do through the general theme was to bring out how the Sikhs have contributed to you know, contemporary British life, British life as a consequence of... Mm. The mutiny is always um, billed as a sort of first war of Indian independence, but of course the Sikhs played a tremendous role in, the, in what we you know, see as the independence movement and the, mm. the outcome of that of 1947 and partition. Many of us came to Britain and have since you know, contributed huge amounts mm. in the field of business and entertainment and sports. So that figures... that pictures crammed full of sick personalities that mm. the research was entirely done by internet. But I have yeah. to say that I think the research in the UK has been easier than, for example, somewhere like India, mm. where we've come across a lot of um, figures who, let's say, put the barriers up. You know, we've had, we've had letters when we were researching as uh, PhD students in mm -hmm. 
1990, both of our areas of research were some aspect of SIC uh, art and culture, or art, uh, SIC visual culture. And at the National Museum in Delhi, for example, we had a letter from the person at the very top to say, you know, open up the doors for these girls, they're here to research and make sure you help them. But that, we found that very quickly was not enough <laughs> when we took that to the curator in charge of the actual SIC collection that we wanted to look at. Hmm. Um, you know, they're very interested in sort of wielding their own petty, you know, power politics, if you like. And mm, it took us a month, yeah, day. I think it took us a month going back daily to finally be allowed access hmm. to those collections. Um, so that was really difficult and I think um, but it didn't yeah, stop give me us a... persevering and no. getting our way. <laughs> I think the best thing about you is your perseverance you know the way mm. you've come through your resilience what you bring to the community what would be your final message to the community the people who aspire to do something but you know sometimes they're afraid of the struggle or sometimes mm. something comes in or an obstacle mm. how do you tell them that yeah. no don't stop there well I think Life in is a, a nutshell, it is don't take no for an answer. Mm. And if you ever get rejection, as one of our, you know, our Chachaji said, you know, if people reject you, that's their problem. Mm. So it's about believing in yourself and believing in what you're doing and just, you know, as I say, just Try keep to push going the and keep going and keep going until, you know, you, you make those strides. And, but I have to say that our success has not been, you know, as alone. We wouldn't be where we are today without the support of our family and, you know, particularly our father, mm. who's always been behind what we do. And whenever we've had struggles, he's been the one in the background saying, don't let them get you down, you know, stand up and, you know, fight your corner. Mm. Don't give in to them. So mm. I think without That's part of the Punjabi that spirit. Well, that Punjabi <laughs> spirit, I think. Any, any, uh, any lessons that our community lead, needs to learn now to mm. take us into a global perspective, give us mm. what we want? Well, I think the work, the fact that we've been invited on Sangath TV is a tremendous step forward, I have to say, because I think one thing we need to do is recognise the power of the media to mm. promote a positive image of who we are as a community. And I think we really have to look beyond the sort of religious historical emphasis that a lot of the, you know, the sick channels are kind of focusing on at the moment mm. and look to the broader... Uh, achievements of what the six are doing as a global community who you know as a community we're very proud of our roots of course we are mm. but we're doing much more beyond Sikhism and you know Sikh history and identity we're contributing in so many ways to different fields different areas of life and I think that's something that we really need to promote more and within that context obviously as artists we really value the power of art to be able to do that as well yeah. because it's not just about artists expressing themselves. I hope that we show through our work that it's also about using um, art as a very powerful language too, to communicate to other people about who we are as a community. Uh, and I and think also it transcends the generations are. as well. Even when the artist is not there, we, we see their work and we get mm. inspired by them. Mm. It was lovely and very inspiring having you both oh, in the studios you. with us. Mm. It was such a pleasure. This is the end of Candid Conversation. The guests were the Singh Twins. We can learn so much from them. Their life, their resilience, their perseverance and the way to go on. Never say, you never give up. I think that's the spirit that we need to learn from them. As a community, we can do so much more from this little lesson. I think that the Candid Conversation is a program that you will be inspired. ਤੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਵੀ ਇਨਸਪਾਇਰ ਹੋਏ ਹੋਗੇ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਵੀ ਆਪਣੇ ਜੀਵਨ 'ਚ ਐਸਾ ਕੁਝ ਕਰੀਏ ਜਿਸ ਨਾਲ ਆਪਣੀ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਕੋਈ ਚੰਗੀ ਦੇਣ ਚੰਗੀ ਸੇਧ ਦੇ ਸਕੀਏ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਧੰਨਵਾਦ ਵਾਹਿਗੁਰੂ ਜੀ ਕਾ ਖਾਲਸਾ ਵਾਹ